It's, yeah, it's really. He's a wonderful guy. I, I hope so. <sighs> Hard to connect policy, huh, to the reality. Yeah. Okay, we're rolling. Okay, how are we doing with the doors out there? Uh, we're all closed in. Okay. All right, what I need you to do is, uh, again, throughout the interview, wow, you're, you're, you're falling apart here. <laughs> Okay, you've had a <laughs> long day, as I understand. You had a long day, as I understand. That is kind of, This one over here. Okay, I'm just trying to get you even. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Is it even now? Yeah, you're, you're fine. Yeah? You're fine. Okay. Um, what I need you to do as we start off is, and you're going to look at me. For, yeah. For, you're going to look away, certainly, but look at me. Talk to you. Uh, I need you to give Rich your entire name, first name, last name, and spell both of them. Okay. No. No. Michelle Contreras, uh, first name M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Contreras, C-O-N-T-R-E-R-A-S. And before you leave, I'm going to have you sign a release. Okay. All right? So don't let me forget that. Okay. Um, I have five questions. Okay. And, uh, uh, again, you've had the opportunity to look at them briefly, and I'm sorry you didn't have them to ingest a lot more. How are the treatment program needs for sex trafficking victims different from standard treatment programs? Hmm. So the most important thing to pay attention to when we're thinking about sex trafficking victims is that this is a poly, uh, it's, it's a population that's been poly-victimized. So what I mean by that is that these are uh, women and girls who have had multiple traumatic experiences throughout the lifespan. So when we're working with a trafficked woman or a trafficked girl, we are not only working with the effects of trafficking, but we're working also with the effects of earlier traumas that made them vulnerable to the trafficking in the first place. So it's a much more complex set of needs that this particular population is going to have. Um, and those needs go above and beyond what standard treatment programs can offer. How do you define success of a treatment program for sex trafficking victims? You know, the first place that my mind goes based on the work that I've done with these girls is if we can get these girls connecting back with communities, connecting um, making safe relationships or establishing safe relationships with others, then I, then we can say that we've been successful. Um, I think it's, we're typically looking at markers of success that are more focused on symptom reduction. And symptom reduction is really but a very first initial step that you want to achieve with anyone that you're trying to treat, any kind of trauma survivor, it's symptom reduction is really going to be just that very initial part of, of the treatment. Uh, with these girls, after you've stabilized them, where you really want to get them to is to a place where they can experience relationships in a healthy way. And that's a little bit more difficult to, to define in a, in a treatment setting or in the kinds of treatment settings that we currently have. Okay, I was thinking here, okay, fine, mm. yeah, that's a wonderful answer. I was thinking here um, about, instead of just her responding to my question about her restating uh, a successful treatment program for sex trafficking victims is I okay. mean, we could always build a setup for it. Yeah. Yeah. How do you want to handle it? You want her just to go ahead and say that? Yeah, you can do that. We can make it work. Okay, looking at me, why don't yep. you go ahead and just say, uh, I find or, or uh, my research has indicated that a successful treatment program for sex trafficking victims consists of, and then just give me like one sentence and then we'll meld into the other one. Okay. The rest of your response. Okay. Okay. So what the research is showing is that a successful um, intervention or a successful treatment program for trafficking victims is one that's going to help people establish healthy relationships, reestablish a basic sense of trust in others that can then permit them connect with healthy, safe people that are going to help them re 
remake the ties to the community that they've lost because of the trafficking. That was a, that was very yeah, a little bit. Are you happy with that? I, I we, think so. If you want I to think change so. it, you have that opportunity. Yeah. Do you want to change it? Um, Are you happy with that? You did You did the, the first part perfectly, exactly. Yeah, the, then I the, got a little bit. Okay, what do you want to do? We can, let's try it again. Okay, let's try it again. Okay. Uh, on your cue. Okay, so um, a successful treatment program, and I'm thinking about this based on my clinical experience with survivors of trafficking and what the research is showing, is a program that's going to help girls reestablish safe relationships with other important people in their lives and with communities. I would say that's, that's probably, um, that is really what we want programs doing for girls. Okay, please. Hmm? You like that answer? Yeah. Okay, good. You're more comfortable with that. Um, Either is fine. You can Yeah, pick. I understand, but I, I want you to be comfortable yeah. with placing sex trafficking victims in physical restrictive environments against their will. How is that harmful? Whew. So, in general, the mental health field as a whole has been trying to move away from restricting people's movement. We know that committing people, hospitalizing people, putting people in residential programs against their will is going to be, by and large, um, non-therapeutic. We try to limit that kind of intervention to situations where people need to be stabilized because they're presenting with a level of acuity or risk that's putting their life in danger or other people's lives in danger. But that's not what we're talking about um, most of the time with trafficked girls. There is nothing in the trauma research, there's nothing in the clinical literature to indicate that locking up anyone, even if it's for treatment purposes, for extended periods of time, is actually going to be beneficial for their mental health and for their recovery. So we're not doing it with anyone else that's requiring mental health services um, there is no reason, there is no research demonstrating that somehow it would be good for this population. I would actually say um, that it's especially not indicated for this population. Okay. All right. Question number four. What should people think when they hear providers say their program models are successful? That's in quotes. Can they make that claim? Why or why not? Well, it depends on how they're thinking about success. Um, is it success based on the best interest of the women and girls? Or is it success uh, defined by um, markers that make us feel sufficiently comfortable that we've controlled something that we're uncomfortable with? So. What I mean by that is that with this population, we are dealing with a number of very difficult and challenging behaviors that we're desperately trying to find ways to extinguish. So for instance, I'm thinking about you know, how high the rate of running is in this population, uh, self-injurious behaviors that are pretty common in this population as well, substance abuse, um, they're constantly putting themselves in harm in harm's way. There are cycles of re-victimization, meaning that they're going back to their traffickers after um, we've already provided them with a substantial amount of intervention. And so if the only marker of success that a program is using is that they were able to interrupt those behaviors by, for instance, locking somebody up over the long term, um, that is a questionable marker of success because it's more about our comfort. Uh, now, the other thing that I would say about markers of success is 
we also have to evaluate what are the kinds of assessment, so what kind of program assessment and evaluation is actually happening. The problem that we have is that oftentimes um, we provide people with funding, organizations with funding to run programs, and then we do not sufficiently fund evaluation programs that run alongside those models that can give us information, that can give us actual markers of success, that can tell us are these girls getting better? And if the answer is yes, then how are we determining that they are getting better? And there are a number of different ways to do that. Um, yeah. That's what do I you want to add anything? Um, you act like you're not. Well, I, see, I, I never feel like I've said enough. That's just a problem that I have. Well, that's uh, fine. I mean, so. you want to say more. <laughs> What we're not going to do is we're not I, going I just to, came from eight hours of talking nonstop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to put you through this. I truly am. How is it sounding? That was good. Okay, it sounds you good. Keep going. It's not bad at all. Okay. Uh, understand we're not going to show this entire piece to Sure, I understand. It's going to be. And if there's anything you want to add, we'll get to that at the end, but if there's anything you want yeah. to add at the end, yeah, please keep that in mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the jargon making sure. it more That's fine. That's real fine. down to earth. And, and we're talking to legislators here, so we need to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Nah. I would, the, okay. <laughs> the fifth of the five questions is comment, actually it's a, the rest for you comment, comment on whether research exists to justify anyone wanting to physically restrict the victim for treatment. In the case of trafficking. In the case of trafficking. In the case of trafficking. I could, I can understand why people would want to move in that direction again, because as I said before, these women and girls present with a number of concerning behaviors. Um, but never in the history of mental health treatment, well, actually, we, we used to do that. We used to lock up people long term, and it was terrible. It was a terrible practice, and we actually learned from those experiences that instead of helping people get better, we were actually making them get worse. Um, what we were actually doing was decreasing the ability that people later had for reintegrating, reconnecting with the communities, the family ties, the relationship ties that we know from a substantial amount of research that those things are healing and do work to help people recover from the effects of a terrible crime like trafficking. Um, so no, there is absolutely nothing in our body of research that would indicate that it's a good practice or that it's going to be somehow um, a healing practice to lock these girls up. We need services that are going to attend to girls when they're presenting with acute services, or with, a, with acute symptoms, the acute services. I'm gonna so, say that again. Yeah, so we, we definitely need services for girls when they're presenting with acute symptoms, when they're presenting with risk that's clearly putting themselves at harm. So I'm thinking about suicidal behaviors um, or when others who are in their care might be at harm. And in those cases, you might need to commit someone to treatment. You might need to section someone to treatment. But those interventions nowadays are sh considered short-term interventions. We know that those are interventions to stabilize people, and we want to move them quickly outside of those units and into therapeutic treatment settings. And therapeutic treatment settings, in principle, will not be settings that will be restrictive of people's basic freedom. We can't have that. Answers you've given thus far, or would you like to just go ahead and make, make a strong case statement? You know, in the training we were talking about how we've been confronted with other social issues that we're very worried about. I understand this move towards wanting 
to lock up girls long term as an intervention to counter the effects of trafficking as our worry and our concern about this population. But, you know, if you think, for instance, about um, women who are in situations of domestic violence, never have we thought that it would be a good idea to lock up those women to protect them from their batterers. So in many ways, what we need are models, treatment programs that help providers, the help the people that are trying to help these girls to deal with that difficulty of having to work with someone that you know might be going back to a situation of exploitation or who might still be caught up in a situation of exploitation. But certainly locking girls up is it's it's not going to be you know the silver bullet that's going to um, counter what's happening to girls when they're in these situations of trafficking. Give me 10 seconds of close. 10 seconds of close. I know you've had a long day, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're exhausted. I am exhausted. <laughs> I, I really, and it's not just me, it's all the colleagues that I work with that are thinking about this issue. Um, we all want to see us moving towards models of intervention that are helping these women make strong, healthy connections with others. And we need more research. Um, we need more people thinking about this together. We need several perspectives. We need to work across disciplines. Um, we really need to bring together an army of providers to help these girls. And I think that the move towards wanting to restrict these girls' freedom is moving us away from having that conversation, from coming together as providers and really thinking about how we can help these girls. Um, also really important is that we have a number of different providers throughout the country. We have a lot of survivor-led initiatives throughout the country. We have a lot of women who have been through this experience and they made it out and they have some very good ideas to bring to the table as well. So we certainly need, we need people to come together and keep thinking because this is not something that we're going to solve with one kind of intervention, with one brainstorming session. This is going to require years of dedication, dear, years of thoughtful, um, constructive, multidisciplined input. Um, and that is what's going to bring us to a set of best practices that are going to be much, much more robust and much, um, you know, much better designed to meet the needs of, of this population. Something like that. Etc. Etc. Um, Thank you. Etc. Thank you for your time. I hope it helps. I'm sure it will. Yeah, sure I will. hope it does.